In your Bibles, if you would look at it, please, uh, John's Gospel, chapter 14, the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Where I am, there you may be also. Where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you'd known me, you would have known my Father also, and from now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Father, as we come at this uh, January Sunday morning, I thank you for these dear folks and for coming out to hear your word and to worship you. Well, we've not come to hear from a man, but we've come to hear from you through your word. We firmly believe this is the inspired, infallible word of the living God. And we thank you, this wonderful gift of the Bible. Lord, we come today to consider again the Lord Jesus Christ and the claims that you've made. And Lord, they are amazing claims. And we thank you, Lord, for who you are as we continue to discover and, and rediscover you every time we come to your house and we worship together. Lord, we think of many who are grieving and many who are hurting, and we lift them up to you. We ask your blessing now as we look into your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to remind you that one of the things I emphasized during our Christmas series was that Jesus could not be merely a good man and make the claims and say the things that he said, and we're going to continue to develop that in this series of messages. We're looking at a critical look at the claims of the Lord Jesus. Now, those claims are found in the four Gospels. So last Sunday, we began this series, and we looked at the trustworthiness of the Gospels. And uh, you have to either believe they're fabrications, fables, or they're actual historical accounts. And Jesus actually said the things and did the things that the Gospels say that he did. And we said that there's very reasonable faith. That it's a faith, but it's a very reasonable faith to believe that the Gospels are trustworthy, and they are giving an accurate account of the life and testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, as I looked at the claims and the different ones that we're going to look at, and they really do inter, you know, interconnect, and we'll see that, but that's okay because that kind of reinforces what we're learning as we go through this series. And so I wanted to start out with the most astounding claim that he made, at least as far as our culture is concerned. I would say to you that as far as our culture is concerned, this is probably the most offensive claim that Jesus made. And when uh, they hear it on our lips as Christians, they are totally offended by it. It's found in verse 6 of John 14. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, we live in a culture like no other culture in history because we have certain technologies that no other culture has ever had and this whole explosion of social media. It's literally changing our culture as we live through it and we're changing it I think even in ways that we don't really uh, comprehend. Never before in history have we had a time when everybody believes they have to have a say. I mean if you watch the football playoffs and and, you know, at the end of those, and then they, everybody's hashtag this, and everybody's, you know, commenting, and everybody wants to say. Everybody believes that, you know, what they believe and, and what they have to say is just as important as anybody else. And I'm not necessarily saying that's wrong, but this technology of social media is literally remaking how people view themselves and how they view other people and how they view the world. We have an immediate access to information, this pervasive connectivity to others in our culture is doing a number of things. It's reshaping the world that we live in. 
This ease of communication has never been so available to people around the world as it is now, and it is still continuing to evolve. We don't even really know how this is going to continue to impact culture the way it is. Now, this has highlighted the belief that everybody's opinion or everybody's belief is valid. And that's not the way I grew up. I grew up that everybody certainly has a right to their opinion, but that doesn't mean that everybody's opinion or belief is valid. That has changed in our culture, and social media has really caused that to be epidemic in our culture. Now, what do we just read of the claim of Jesus? I am the way, not a way. I am the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father, Jesus said, except through me. Now, when you say that to people in our culture, they say what? You are intolerant. You are even bigoted. Because the Internet has made the world such a smaller place, people, particularly those in younger generations, have access to belief systems and other religions that maybe before they would only read about. And then you have the whole influx of people coming into our country. And so religions that at one time seemed distant and far away are people we work with and we know and our next door neighbors. Religions like Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim are part, part of our culture. Now this whole mix has created something that's certainly been around, but it really is highlighted in the culture of the 21st century in America and around the world. Religious pluralism has become the conventional wisdom. You say, what do you mean by that? To make the claim that Jesus is the only way seems narrow and even cruel to many people in our culture. They want us to believe that every truth claim, every religion should be viewed as equally valid. And for anybody to stand up and say that what I believe is, you know, totally exclusive, I mean, who in the world do we think we are? Well, we are Christians, so that means we name the name of Christ. So we are repeating what Jesus said. So the real question is, who in the world does Jesus, or did Jesus, think that he was? And we have to think this through. Notice this. Jesus' claim invalidates all other such claims. It totally invalidates other claims to salvation, to know God, because Jesus said, I am the way, and I'm the truth, and I'm the only way to life. And there's no one who's going to come to the Father except through me. And Jesus spoke clearly. He spoke directly. He said exactly what he meant to say. That claim may offend you this morning, but I want you to understand that's exactly what Jesus said. And if you understand exactly what Jesus said, and not try to explain it away like some of the liberals and people do, I mean, Jesus said exactly what he meant to say. And so if you understand that logically, that invalidates every other truth claim to knowledge of God and how you get to God. And so this reveals that Christianity is not simply one of the great religions of the world. It's not as Gandhi said. The need of the moment is not one religion but mutual respect and tolerance of the different religions. Now, again, in my, in, in my era, when I grew up, tolerance meant I have my view, you have your view, you're, you're, you're welcome to your view, but I don't agree with it. That's not what tolerance is today. Tolerance means that everybody has a view and everybody's view is equally valid. That makes absolutely no sense. Let me give you an example. Islam says and absolutely believes that Jesus Christ was not incarnate, meaning that he is not God come in the flesh. They absolutely, completely deny that with a vengeance. What do we believe? The incarnation of Jesus Christ as God in the flesh is the basis of our, our belief. It, it's at the center of Christianity. So how could Islam's claim be valid and how could our claim be valid? So in this series, I'm trying to get you to use your mind. Understand these things from a rational way. 
The Bible is a very rational book. Are there some amazing things in the Bible that are hard to understand, certain miraculous things? Absolutely. And we talked last week about how some people have a philosophical bias. Uh, they believe we live in a closed system. There is no God. We're all here by evolution. So therefore, they immediately discount miracles. But as we're going to see, that's not even a rational viewpoint. And so the Apostle John, who, by the way, this account is the Last Supper. This is right before Jesus goes out and gets arrested and then the trials and then he's crucified. The man who wrote the Gospel of John is the Apostle John, who was sitting at the table right beside Jesus that very night. He heard Jesus make this claim, and he heard the other claims that Jesus made. And the Apostle John does not equivocate on this in any way whatsoever. Uh, 2 John, verse 7, just one example. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess cr Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. And once you understand that the apostles, the Apostle John, who sat at the table, who heard Jesus make this claim, and when he writes his epistle under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, his second epistle, 2 John, and we can point out other verses that John wrote in his epistles, he, he unequivocally says, listen, if you deny the incarnation that Jesus came in the flesh, you are antichrist, you are a deceiver. Sounds pretty exclusive, doesn't it? Now notice this, Jesus' claim is exclusive because the gift of salvation is exclusive. Now, what I mean by exclusive is in Jesus. The gift of salvation is exclusive. There is one offer by God of salvation through one means, Jesus Christ, his atoning work on the cross, what, what Randy sang about and what, what the ladies played about. This, this is the exclusive claim of salvation, and that's what Jesus is saying. I'm the only way to God. You say, well, logical people don't believe that. If you're educated, you have to dismiss Christianity immediately. Last week, we talked about a man by the name of Ramsey. Today, I want to talk about a man by the name of Clive Staples Lewis. You know him as C.S. Lewis. He was born in 1898 and died in 1963. Even secular people will tell you he was one of the intellectual giants of the 20th century, probably the most influential writer of his day. He was a fellow and tutor in English literature at Oxford University until 1954 when he was unanimously elected to the chair of medieval and renaissance literature at Cambridge University. These are extremely prestigious positions in academia. Lewis had grown up in a religious family in Ireland. At the age of 15, he determined to become an atheist. He just couldn't buy into the fact there was so much suffering in the world. How could there be a good God who would allow so much suffering? But God began to work in his life and bring people around him like Tolkien and other people. And in 1929, he didn't become a Christian, but he became a theist. He became a believer in God. He said, well, at least now I would believe there, there is a God. And then a few years later, he actually became a Christian. Now, the funny thing about Lewis was he was an intellectual, and he didn't want to become a Christian. <laughs> In fact, he tried everything he could not to become a Christian. He described himself as the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. <laughs> but you see, he was a rational man. He was an intelligent man. He began to view the evidence for the claims of Jesus Christ. He wrote a book about his testimony called Surprised by Joy. He had a great sense of humor. He says in that book, really a young atheist cannot guard his faith too carefully. Dangers lie in wait for him on every side. A young man who wishes to remain a sound atheist cannot be too careful of his reading. There are traps everywhere, Bibles laid open, millions of surprises, fine nets and stratagems. God is, if I may say it, very unscrupulous. <laughs> I like that. You see, C.S. Lewis experienced something else about God. He examined the evidence, and he finally and reluctantly even concluded that Jesus Christ had to be the Son of God, God of very God, and the claims that he made were very true, and so therefore he personally experienced another claim of Jesus Christ. Luke 19.10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. 
one day after his conversion, and, and Lewis became a staunch defender, an apologist for the gospel and, and, and for, the, for Christianity. Some professors at Oxford were debating the merits of all the world religions. And, and Lewis came by and he said, what's all the ruckus about? When he learned what the debate was and what, about what is the uniqueness of Christianity to all the other religions, Lewis said, oh, that's easy, it's grace. It's grace. It's grace. You see, that's the distinction between what we believe in every other religion and belief system in existence. Every one of them combines some kind of faith with works, every single one of them, in order to be saved. Only biblical Christianity. Now, there are those who call themselves Christianity, but they teach a works plus faith salvation. That's not biblical teaching of Christianity. That's not what the Lord Jesus taught. That's not what the epistles teach and the apostles taught. You can't mix the two. Only Jesus offers man salvation based upon grace and not works. Grace by very definition means an unearned favor, undeserved. We cannot earn it. We, can't, we don't deserve it. We are all sinners before a holy God. And so logically, if you believe there's a God, and if you accept the fact, which I don't, any rational person must understand, they have at some point violated the laws of God in some way, and your, even your own conscience that God puts in you is going to tell you that. So logically, if you believe there's a God, and you can try to deny him, but if you believe there's a God, then, then the question is, how do I think that when I die, I'm going to be with God if he's holy and I'm sinful? And so logically, there's only two, two, two ways. One is God provides salvation for me as a gift, or I have to help God save myself and keep myself saved. I mean, logically, those are the only two possible conclusions. Grace means that salvation can't be earned. Earlier in the Gospel of John, back in chapter 1, verse 16, when he's introducing his gospel, he's talking about Jesus. And he says, Of his fullness we've all received, and grace for grace, grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You see, God's law teaches us that we are all sinners. Even people who do not have access to the Bible will see, instinctively know there's a God, and they instinctively know there's something wrong, they have a conscience, and when they do something wrong, they know there's an issue there. And so in Jesus, we have grace and truth. Only by the cross could grace and truth be reconciled in the offering of Jesus for our sin. The truth is, all men are sinners. I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. There's not a just man on the earth who does good and does not sin. So the issue is my sin, and the issue is God is holy. So how is this going to come together? The truth that I'm a sinner, well, the, the way that comes together is the grace of God. Think about where we are in John chapter 14. We are at the Last Supper. Uh, Jesus, J uh, Judas has gone out after Jesus washed all the disciples' feet and he even washed Judas' feet. I think he even knew Judas had the money in his robe. He knew he would betray him. He even offered him one last opportunity to repent and G Judas, full well knowing what he was doing, went out into the night and to continue the betrayal of Jesus. So Jesus has the 11 disciples there, uh, 12 minus Judas, and he begins to give them this amazing teaching, and he gives them this amazing claim, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. And this is what they would carry with them after Jesus rose from the dead. Paul wrote in Romans 3.23, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. See, a lot of times people go to church and they do religious stuff and they hear religious teachings, but they don't put two and two together. They don't rationally think it through. How could grace and works mix together? That, that's a non-rational argument because grace by definition automatically excludes works. So if you think 
is, is, getting saved is some kind of mixture of going to church and being good and, and, and having faith. That doesn't even make sense. To believe that salvation is the result of some kind of mixture of that. Here's what Paul teaches in Romans 11:6. If it's by grace, it's no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it's of works, it's no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Now, a child could understand that. That's pretty simple. That's pretty basic. That's just basic logic. If grace means it's something you can't work for, then you cannot mix grace and works. The moment you do that, you cancel out grace. And, 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 and the other way, if, if you say, I'm going to work my way to heaven, but, but if it's all of grace, that automatically cancels out works. And so but grace, by definition, eliminates works. Now, this is what the New Testament clearly teaches, Romans chapter 4. Paul says, now to him who works, you got that part? To him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. If you believe you can work your way to heaven, you are putting God in your debt. And the Bible says God will be a debtor to no man. If, if you can work your way to heaven, that means God owes you something. You and I who are wretched sinners who have violated the holy law of God, that means God's in our debt. Does that make sense to you? On the other hand, Paul goes on to say this. But if it's of... But believe, but to him who does not work. Now, see the obvious contrast there. You have the person who works, meaning for salvation. You have to him who does not work, but believes. So what do you put in the place of works? Faith. But he believes on him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is accounted for righteousness. Even in the Old Testament, Abraham believed God. It was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham I had a lot of issues and a lot of problems just like we do. And the only way to get to heaven is by grace through faith. That's exactly what the Bible clearly teaches. Ephesians 2, 5, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's amazing what you find out when you just read the Bible, you know? It's amazing the truth that you can discover when you get rid of all the religious hype and all the religious terminology and you just open up your Bible and you read what the Bible clearly teaches. It's either grace or it's works. And you cannot mix the two. And to think that some kind of moralism, some kind of following the teachings of Jesus mixed with some kind of religious ceremonialism is going to wipe the sin from my heart so I can have eternal access to God, that is not logical. It might sound good in church. It might make you feel better about yourself. Because, you see, that's why people like religion. That's why the, the Jews of the first century, they, they were enamored with their own self-righteousness. I cannot be that bad. I can see a lot of people in the world who are a lot worse than I am. I can understand the child molesters and the, you know, and, and the pimps and all those people. But see, before God, sin is sin. And we're all sinners. Now... Not only do have people have a problem with the exclusivity of the claim of Jesus, I'm the way, the only way. And in our 21st century culture, that's extremely offensive. There are some people who, who carry that another step, and it's this one. They reject Jesus' claim because of those who've never heard. And this is what you will, you'll hear this. You go out and you begin to share the gospel with people and tell them that Jesus is the one and only way, and they will immediately throw up in your face, well, what about the people who have never heard? That's not fair. And they begin to examine God based on their own concepts and limited understanding. See, the answer to the question relates to God's nature, God's nature, His revelation, and our response. 
If you study the Bible, you find out that God is holy, but he's also a God of love. You discover he is a God of mercy. He is just. He is unchanging. I mean, we are at the Last Supper. In, you know, in, in, in a matter of hours, Jesus is going to go to the cross. He is going to die an agonizing death. And God the Father, in a way we can't even comprehend, is going to pour out the sin of all the world on his own son. He goes willingly. He goes because he loves sinners. He wants people to be saved. And so to just dismiss this as, wait a minute, apparently God can't handle, or what about the people who have never heard? Do you think God is capricious? Do you think that God is unloving? Do you think God will always do what is right? Well, if you study the Bible and if you know the God of the Bible, you have to believe that God doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't make errors. Like he said to Abraham, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And so this begins to reflect on the character of God. But again, where do we get answers for this? We get answers in the Bible. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. What about those who have never heard a clear presentation of the gospel? Or maybe they've never even heard the name of Jesus Christ. What about them? Well, look in your Bibles at Romans chapter 1 and notice verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteous, ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, now here it is, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now Paul is talking about universal application, all people have ever lived, okay? And what does he tell us? Because that what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. We call that the witness of conscience. God has placed within every person a God awareness. They know instinctively there's a God. Solomon said God has put eternity in their hearts. They know, even though they try to deny it and, and, and try to say there is no God, and they try to embrace evolution, but as we saw last week, many people do that, not even out of a rational reason. It's not their mind rejecting God. It's their will rejecting God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want someone to be accountable to. And so Paul goes on to explain this. He says there's another witness they have, not only the witness within them, the witness outside of them. For since the creation of the world is invisible, attributes are clearly seen. Notice the wording, clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Now here it is so that they are without excuse. Now, Paul wrote that, but Paul wrote that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is God's answer to the question, what about those who have never heard? Even in the Old Testament, it says his voice is going to the ends of the earth. There is a general knowledge that a God exists, but what does sinful man do with that knowledge? Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful. They became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Here's intellectual man's response. Professing to be wise, they became fools. If you study creation, it takes a lot more faith to be an evolutionist than a creationist. If you see the intricacies, and now what, what, they've, what they've uncovered with the human cell and all that that's all going on with the genome and all that stuff, and you see that, the evidence of design, and it's just, it's just overwhelming, yet man will not face it. Dawkins talks about the beauty of evolution. It's exactly what it talks here. Verse 25, they exchange the truth of God for the lie. They worship and serve the creature or the creation rather than the creator. That's exactly what Dawkins has done and people like him. They've looked at this massive amount of evidence in creation, and they have substituted their own philosophy of evolution, which is not a proven science at all. And so they have this philosophical argument. They're rejecting God from their will, not from their mind. And in his own statement, he says, the beauty of evolution, and look what evolution is producing. What's he done? He's done exactly what Paul said. 
He substituted and worshipped the creation instead of the creator. There is no one who is totally ignorant of God. There is really no person who's ever lived who does not have enough information to seek God. And what did Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? He said, ask and it will be given to you. He said, knock, it'll be open to you. Seek and you will find. Yet the vast majority of mankind chooses to reject the light that they have. You say, well, well, think about the people in Jesus' day. People who saw Jesus, heard Jesus. He came unto his own, John said, his own received him not. The people who should have received him, first century Jews, totally rejected him. So here's something you need to understand. We must recognize that people are not lost because they haven't heard. They're lost because they're sinners. Please understand that. People are not lost because they haven't heard. People are lost because they're sinners. If you believe that God's going to give somebody some kind of chance apart from Jesus, why in the world would God commission us to go into all the world? That's a bad plan. I mean, being a missionary is the worst thing you could do for somebody who's never heard because then you make them culpable. And if they reject, they go to hell. And if they're going to go to heaven anyways, the best thing we could do is never, ever send another missionary. And, 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 and the only people you should witness to are people who happen to hear the name of Jesus. Think that through logically. Now, I'm not saying that that squares with my concepts of fairness. What I'm telling you is what the Bible teaches. And when you can't trace God's hand, you have to trust God's heart. The secret things belong to the Lord. I, I'm not trying to answer for God. He can answer for himself. What I'm telling you is, what about your own heart? What I say to people when they come back to me about what about those who have never heard, I say, but what about you? You've heard. And so we can talk about that later, but what about you? You are responsible for what you've heard. You know, God loves people, lost people. He's provided it by sending his son to die for them. But here's what I do know. No one will be saved apart from faith in Jesus Christ. No one will be saved apart from faith in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me, period. Exclusivity. Who does he think he is? Well, Jesus' claim of exclusivity is based upon his identity. We'll develop this more in the weeks ahead. Who could make such a claim? God. And only God. He said in verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He's saying this to Jewish men who, who believe in one God. And this is why the Jews had such a hard time understanding Jesus was God. Because they, they were so connected to the God of the Bible. And we're going to see how Jesus clearly tells them, I am that God, the one true God, the God of Israel. But I've now come in the flesh. The claim of being the way of salvation is outrageous. Unless the person making the claim is God. And so Jesus didn't claim to be a God. That's not what he said. We're going to see that he claimed to be the God. He either is or he isn't. He either is or he isn't. But notice his claims. Verse 7, if you'd known me, we're back in John now, verse four, chapter 14, if you'd known me and you'd known the Father. Philip says, show us the Father. And Jesus said, have I been so long with you, Philip, and you, you, don't, you don't know me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now how, how much clearer could he say that? The Bible says, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I realize this was a new concept for these men, but, but they began to understand who Jesus truly was. What's the evidence? Jesus' teaching and his miracles. The evidence of Jesus' deity is his teaching of miracles. Anybody can stand up and say they're God. And a lot of people down through history have said they're God. They've claimed to be God. You know, I can stand up here on Sunday morning and say, I am Jesus, come back in the flesh. Now, you would immediately discount me as a lunatic or, or some kind of crazy person. But if I started going to graveyards and raising people from the dead, you might want to take a little closer look. But see, Jesus is the only one who could back up his claim with the evidence. 
So he says in verse 10, do you not believe that I'm in the Father and the Father in me? Okay, here's two things to look at, and we're going to look at these in the weeks ahead. The words that I speak to you. And then he said, and the Father who dwells in me does the works. The words and the works. Back in John 7, 46, it says, no man ever spoke like this man. People, even his enemies, went to arrest him, and they came back, and they, and, and they said, temple please, why didn't you bring him? Nobody ever spoke like him. So this is the other thing we're going to talk about, the claims of Jesus. He claims to be God. He's either God, or he's a deceiver, or he's out of his mind. When you look at the words and the teachings of Jesus, they are not the words of somebody out of their mind, okay? You might try to describe them as some, some kind of cleverly devised, you know, um, uh, illusion, but then you see how he lived, and you see his works, and you see the, you know, he said one time to his enemies, which one of you can, you know, point out a sin in my life? That's an amazing statement. I won't have to go to my enemies. I just have to go to my wife. Point out a sin in my life. Oh, how many do you want? You want a list? You're like, you know, you want me to categorize them? Jesus said that to his enemies, and they were dumb, silent. So there's a lot of reasons why in what Jesus taught, in the way he lived, and in the claims that he made. And I'm challenging you to think about this logically. Jesus' first followers believed and taught this claim. Do you know how the early Christians were identified Acts chapter 9, verse 2, those who were of the way. See, that's when Paul went to Saul, went to persecute Christians to Damascus. He was finding people who were of the way. Why were they called of the way? Because they taught what Jesus told them to teach. There's only one way. See, they were living in a pluralistic society in first century Rome, just like we're living in. Ours is getting almost as pagan. And so if they wanted to come along and say Jesus was a God, they would have been fine. Oh, that's okay, cool. We got lots of gods. You want to put Jesus in with our gods? No problem. That's not what they said. They went around teaching what Jesus taught. He's the way, the one and only way. All these other gods are false. There's only one God, and he's come in the person of Jesus. That's why the persecution came. It's what Peter taught. Nor is there salvation in any other. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This is what Paul taught. There's one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. Jesus is the only way to God because he is God, period. He's the only way to God because he is God. And the evidence for that is the resurrection, let alone the word and works that he did. His life is massive evidence and is capped off with the resurrection of Jesus Christ coming back from the dead and all the evidence surrounding that. I referenced this book last week, More Than a Carpenter. It takes a logical view of the claims of Jesus and the person of Jesus. It won't take you long to read it if you're a reader. This is not for the committed Christian who's here. This isn't for you. But if you're here today and you're not sure about the claims of Jesus, or you're, you're, you're an honest seeker, we want to give you this book. Stop by the Welcome Center. Just say, I like that book more than a carpenter. You don't have to answer any questions. I'll just hand you one. So I want to challenge you. If you're not sure about who Jesus is, if, you're not, if you don't believe this, he's the one and only way, would you stop by the Welcome Center and pick one of these up? Take it and read it. And then interact with one of us pastors here. We'd love to talk to you about it. Because we believe, yes, it's faith, but we believe it's a very reasonable, logical, rational faith when you examine the evidence. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for coming and dying on the cross for our sins. Lord, we know you're the only way because you're God, and you came and you died for us. And so... Every other truth claim, every other religion fails in comparison that God would come from heaven and become a man, live the sinless life, give us the proof, die on the cross, and then rise from the dead. Lord, we thank you for our amazing Savior. We pray for some that are here and they're honestly seeking 
We thank you they're here. Lord, may they truly consider the evidence. May they try to put away their religious bias or their philosophical bias. May they really examine the evidence. May they ask God to show them. Because we believe that you will, just like you did for C.S. Lewis and many others. We we'll thank you for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for being in church today. Have a great day.